Well, I'm assuming that you have figured out by now that this week's topic is going to be lenses. And why would we spend a week on the topic of lenses? Well, one of the big reasons is that virtually everybody in the photo world thinks that the lens is the single most important piece of equipment in terms of creating image quality. So if you want to get the very best image, the truth is the biggest influence on that is going to be the quality of the lens that you get. The problem with that is good lenses often involve a real budgetary decision and impact. Good lenses are not cheap. I'm sure you've noticed that already. So making the decision to select a lens is a big one. And how do you normally go about selecting one? How do you normally go about figuring out where you're going to spend all of your hard-earned dollars? Well, there's a bunch of different options. Number one, you can be swayed by a glossy advertisement. That's why they make those in order to try to persuade you. Once you get into the commercial world of advertising, you'll be doing the same thing, trying to persuade somebody to buy that product. So you need to be a little careful about these. Or is it to get something that you have reviewed online or maybe in a magazine? Well, as you know, everything on the Internet's true. I mean, how can they put something on the Internet that isn't true? Maybe it's a friend's recommendation. Hey, I just got this cool lens. You, I mean, you really need one of these. Really? Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's because it's the coolest looking. And goodness knows there are some really cool looking lenses out there. But is that a reason for you to buy one or the other? I don't think so. And maybe, worst of all, you've fallen prey to a salesperson who is suggesting the latest, greatest, fastest, most glorious lens out there is exactly what you need and ought to have. Well, I would suggest a different way. I'd recommend you doing your own research based on, number one, what are the characteristics of the lenses that you're looking at? And as importantly, maybe more importantly, is how do those characteristics relate to your own real needs for a lens, the way you intend to use that lens? Well, let's look first at some of the, those characteristics and see what they are, and then we'll apply them to different genres of photography. And maybe that'll help you decide what's going to be the best lenses for you. First of all, one of the critical characteristics of lenses is, is it a prime lens or a zoom lens? A prime lens merely means that it is a single focal length lens, a 50 millimeter lens, a 100 millimeter lens, for example. A zoom lens always gives you two numbers. This is a 70 to 200 or a 100 to 400, or a 50 to 4,000, whatever it is, those mean that it's a zoom lens. Now, there are some pros and cons to each one, so let's take a look at a little table here and see where we can put the check mark in terms of which is going to get the highest marks, the prime lens or the zoom lens. In terms of resolution, the prime lens is almost always a little sharper. The more glass you put into the barrel, the more you have to move it back and forth to change focal lengths, the more likely you are at some point to be killing resolution. A prime lens is a simpler lens and almost always has higher resolution. The same goes for contrast. All of that light bouncing around in one of those big lenses is going to affect contrast. And generally speaking, prime lenses have a little better contrast. The weight a big zoom lens, especially a big fast zoom lens with image stabilization, is a heavy lens. The prime lenses are a lot lighter to carry around. Speed speed refers to the aperture. We'll talk about that more in detail in a minute or two. But generally speaking, prime lenses are faster lenses than zoom lenses. How about distortion? Once again, because it is a much simpler lens, the prime lenses generally have less optical distortion than the zooms. But now we come to the big one, convenience. Aha, uh -huh, well, zoom lenses now start really coming into their own. Instead of buying a bag full of prime lenses, 
a good zoom lens is that covers not only those prime settings, but everything in between can be really, really handy. Well, the sweet spot variables are important because the more of them there are, the more there is to go wrong in terms of how that lens is set. In a prime lens, you've really only got two variables. The aperture, which we've talked about before, and the focal distance. Different types of lenses are designed based on the estimation of how they're going to be used. A long lens, people are assuming they're going to be focusing further out, so they're optimized out there. A macro lens is designed to be focused close. That's where its optimization is. So you've got those two characteristics. In a zoom lens, we add one. We've got the aperture, we've got the focal distance, but now another variable is the focal length. At what setting is it? At 70 millimeters, 200 millimeters? Every lens is going to have optimal settings. Do those happen to be where you are shooting? And does it matter to your shooting? Well, another characteristic is going to be the angle of view based on the focal length. And that's really the part of it that most people high center on because that's what lets us talk about cropping. So there are some general categories that have been around for a long time. And here they are. Ultra wide angles, wide, normal, light tellies, tellies, super tellies. These are generally the accepted focal lengths for those. Different texts may have a very slightly different take on it, but roughly this will be where most of them fall. And the angle of view is going to give you a sense of what it is you're actually seeing through it, or, put another way, how you are cropping that image. So it's important, but it's not the major consideration. So how about the speed? Well, when we talk about the speed of a lens, what we're really talking about is the widest aperture. If it can open up wider, then it's going to let in more light. And the more light it lets in with the aperture, the shorter the shutter duration can be. And therefore, it's a faster lens. It's kind of a bizarre way of getting around that term speed. But that's really what it's talking about. A fast lens is capable of opening up wider than a slower lens. The sweet spot in a lens is important because depending on what you're shooting, that sweet spot is going to be important to you. If you're really after the optimal image quality, being able to set your lens to that sweet spot is important. We already dealt with this once when we talked about focus stacking. But that issue doesn't go away when we get off of the issue of depth of field generally. Often, the sweet spot, meaning the point in the aperture setting, in this case, where you're getting maximum optical quality, is usually, for most camera lenses, two to three f-stops greater, meaning a smaller diameter, than wide open. So, for example, if the widest aperture is f2.8, then the sweet spot would be between f5.6 and f8, because as you go up the rank, f4 would be one stop, f5.6 would be two stops, f8 would be three stops. So right in that area is going to be your best use. You need to think about that, as you'll see in a minute when we talk about genres, when you're getting your lens. How about resolution and contrast? Well, these are kind of important. How sharp can that lens be? And what's the contrast ratio? These are measured by two different measurements. LPMM stands for line pairs per millimeter. We brushed over this early on in the class, but it's a way of measuring resolution. How many line pairs per millimeter can you record and still differentiate between them? The MTF curve really helps combine both the resolution measurement and a contrast measurement to give us a more accurate picture of how that lens works. And in the handout, there's an illustration about how the MTF curve works. What's the quality of the glass itself? You know, glass, there's glass and there's glass. Some of the best glass is coming from Germany these days, and consequently, manufacturers like 
Zeiss, uh, like Schneider, um, like some of the lights lenses for the Leicas are considered to be some of the best lenses in the world. And partially it's because of the quality of the glass that comes from that part of the world. Then there is the quality of the polish on the lens elements. I love this term. It's called scratch and dig. And that's the basic term for how well a lens is polished. The finer the polish, the sharper the image is going to be. Build quality and durability. Is it going to last? Is it strong? Is it made out of metal or is it made out of plastic? Well, there are times when that can be important to you. Other times where it doesn't matter. There's nothing wrong with the composite lenses. The only downside is that plastic barrel and plastic gears will wear out faster, especially if you let dirt get in and grind away on those gears. So it's a durability issue, but it doesn't mean that a plastic lens is a bad lens. You can generally take just as good a picture with a lens in a plastic barrel as you can a lens in a metal barrel until it starts to wear. And then there's the issue of weather sealing. How well sealed is this lens against the elements? If you're shooting in the studio all the time or always on location in good weather, then it really doesn't matter. But if you're outdoors, if you might be out in the rain or snow, or going to Yosemite and wanting to shoot Bridal Veil Falls, where it's like you're in a tropical rainforest, then the issue of weather sealing is a big issue for you. Size and weight. Well, if you're going to carry this puppy around, then that issue of size and weight becomes really important to you. If you're a backpacker, man, this really becomes important. So these can be important elements to you. All of these need to be considered. All of these parameters need to be put in terms of what is the right combination for the way you shoot. So that's our main issue. What is the critical need? What are you going to do with it? Well, if you want to shoot portraiture, for example, and I'm talking here about normal, traditional portrait concepts and ideals, then you want to have minimal distortion. And to do that, you're probably going to want a light telephoto from 85 to 150 millimeters. You're going to have a reasonable working distance to your subject, and you'll get minimal, if any, distortion in the face. Most people don't like it when their face looks like a barrel. If you're going to be using electronic flash, then your sweet spot is going to need to be around f8 or f11 in order to work with the electronic flash units. But if you're using continuous light, then you can set that camera to almost anything and to control depth of field a little more precisely, you may want to be able to have your sweet spot between f4 and maybe f8 at the greatest. Generally speaking, portraits are done indoors or in good weather, even if they're on location. So weather sealing isn't normally a big deal. How about product and commercial work? That's, for many, where the real money is. What are we going to need in terms of lenses? Well, here we get into a specialized world. You do need minimal distortion. People don't like to have their products look weird, look stretched or distorted in any way. So you're going to be shooting with 100 to 200 millimeters or equivalent most of the time. Not all the time, but most of the time. And that's a good focal length to start with. Frequently, because of depth of field issues, you're going to need a tilt shift. Or the truth is, this becomes academic because you're really going to be needing to use a view camera anyway. Color accuracy is important. The color is a result of how light waves from different parts of the spectrum are passed through these glass elements. Depending on how that lens is made and depending on the quality of the glass, there can be some huge differences here. You want good contrast. You want a good high MTF curve. And again, we'll talk about that in uh, the handout. You want the sweet spot to match a flash exposure and depth of field needs because you're going to be shooting mostly with electronic flash, studio flash. You're going to be mostly indoors or in non-inclement weather locations, so weather sealing may not be that big a deal for you. How about wedding and events? Well, now we're getting into some interesting stuff from a lens standpoint. 
You're going to be moving around. You want something lightweight. You may be carrying several lenses. You don't want to have all that weight adding up. You want a faster lens because you're going to be hand-holding the shot, probably, at least a lot of them. So you want to be able to use a fast shutter speed. And you want it durable because this is going to be in and out of cases and transportation areas. You just want a good quality lens that's going to last under some heavy, heavy use. And you may want fast switching of focal lengths, so it could well be that a zoom lens is your best option here. How about photojournalism and sports? Well, the truth is, you have an almost identical need as you would to weddings and events, but there are a couple of additions. Number one, durability really becomes important because you are really going to be abusing those lenses and cameras as you carry them around. And you very likely will be in inclement weather, so it needs to be able to deal with that. For those kinds of things, you also need a fast frame rate, but that's not a lens issue. That's a camera body issue. How about for landscape? Well, here, weight can again be an issue if you're going to be backpacking. If you're always working out of your car, weight is irrelevant. But if you're putting this stuff in a pack and carrying it around, the weight of those lenses adds up quickly. You need a sweet spot that's fairly high so that you can get the sharpest image where you've got a fair amount of depth of field at all of the focal lengths you're shooting at. So fast lenses are not your friend in the landscape world. Sometimes, even there, you can use tilt-shift lenses because of depth of field issues. And fashion? Oh man, all bets are off in fashion. Fashion shooters use it all. They combine all of the heavy needs of portraiture, commercial, wedding and events. They have to do it all. These people generally are going to be into some fairly expensive lenses. Cost and brand issues. Well, now we have an interesting discussion. Third-party lenses versus house brand lenses. Until very recently, house brand lenses were the only ones that were worth having, and most third-party lenses had terrible quality control, and you might get a great one, you might get a horrible one, and you never knew till you got it. But recently, some of the better-known third-party lenses, Sigma, Tamron, especially, are making some very high-quality lenses for a lot less than the house brand lenses, so they're worth taking a look at. At the bottom line, as a student, you're going to want to get the most bang for the buck possible. That's simply the reality of it. So you need to look at different lenses to select them carefully. Spend your money on what you need. Don't spend it just because somebody else has one and they like it or they think it's this really cool lens. Save your money for the good ones when you need it. Now when we get to part two, we're going to examine the compositional effects of what happens when you change focal lengths and focal distance to affect spatial relationships. That's when these different lenses really, really become important to you compositionally. They are far more than simply cropping tools. So stand by. We'll get to that in a little bit. And meantime, review this. Read the handout that's online. It goes into a great deal more depth, uh, more information on this. So take care. I'll see you in part two.